we're going to be moving to a series of presentations. Uh, the presentations come from our collaborators and uh, some graduate students who've used the data uh, for uh, various projects and theses. You're going to learn more about the speakers from their bios in the conference program. So I'm not going to introduce them in great depth. And reminder that although their presentations are 15 minutes and they could easily take uh, two hours, uh, you'll have a chance to ask them questions during the Q&A session later on. And again, keep track of the presenters uh, and, the sp and the speakers by scrolling down below the conference uh, agenda. I'd like to introduce the first three speakers. Uh, Laura Allsway, um, psychologist for the Thames Valley School Board. Mike Saxton, who's a psychologist with Kinark Child and Family Services. And Catherine Reef, psychologist with London Family Court Clinic. Uh, all three are my former PhD students and now uh, practicing as uh, psychologists. And I think Mike's going to start. Awesome. So I'll take it away. So it's going to be a, a bit of a, a rapid fire kind of approach to, to this because uh, we're condensing all of our dissertations down into five little minute segments. So uh, bear with us as we kind of move through this. So we're going to be talking about uh, what we found in terms of phase three, which was key informant uh, interview data that looked across the sectors at some of the challenges and promising practices to addressing uh, you know, risk for children in the context of domestic violence. And I'm going to be talking specifically about the police response uh, to children at risk. Uh, so we know that, uh, you know, police play a, a really kind of important role in, in responding to, to domestic violence. Um, they often are uh, the first uh, public agents that become aware of, you know, a very uh, secretive and private kind of sphere and often have a very unique role in that they have an obligation to, to act and intervene to protect families and, and children uh, in that regard. Um, many have kind of perceived police as kind of the gatekeepers to the, the justice system and the potential uh, services that affords, but it's, it's also important to acknowledge that the role of a police officer is not perfect and the, the system in and of itself uh, has some complex issues that um, we certainly need to consider, including, you know, uh, over policing in, in racialized communities and, and marginalized populations. That, that's kind of a big piece of, of the puzzle. Um, when we look specifically at the research on the police response to, to children in the context of domestic violence, um, there really is little that has been done to date. The, the research that is present uh, really shows that police are often overlooking uh, children's needs and, and risks um, and often sidelining them uh, in that regard. So that really leads us to the question of what's actually taking place for police here in Canada and, and specifically here in Ontario, uh, which we uh, were able to find that, you know, a majority of police officers are saying that they are frequently engaging with children uh, in the context of their response to domestic violence and on scene. Um, the majority of police officers are also saying that uh, they're using a structured risk assessment tool uh, in, that, in that response. So that balance, really begs the question of, you know, given that there is research that suggests that children are still being sidelined and overlooked, yet we're having police say that they're frequently engaging with children, uh, as well as having some level of a structured risk assessment tool that they use, what's kind of happening there? And that really kind of was the guiding question for, for my dissertation, uh, to really get a little bit more nuanced information about uh, what, what's actually taking place, especially in the, the context of Ontario. Uh, and getting a police perspective uh, with what are some of the, the barriers that that's uh, being accounted for in terms of the mechanisms of, of children being overlooked. So using uh, kind of the key informant interviews for police officers in Ontario, there's some real major themes that emerged for the barriers to, to address you know, risks to, to children in the context of domestic violence. Uh, one of the important ones is that police officers are, are really recognizing that there is this level of inconsistency within their ranks uh, at the police level uh, where they're inconsistently understanding or, or being aware or addressing the needs at, uh, of children and, and families. Um, 
and that lack really extends to uh, an understanding of the, the impact that domestic violence has on children, including kind of that trauma uh, informed framework or lens that can really help guide that. Uh, and part of that is a, an overall lack of training uh, that, that exists. There's also a clear heavy reliance on pr procedural influences, uh, including, you know, heavy reliance on outside expertise and um, especially referrals to child protection services and oftentimes that's one directional and uh, police themselves are, are feeling like there is a bit of a passing of the buck uh, so to speak when it when it comes to the procedures that they follow and by and large they're acknowledging the the family complexities that uh, really can uh, make the barriers difficult and and uh, there's a real reluctance to work with police, but also there's a lot of coexisting kind of concerns that, that exist within a family system, including you know, addictions and mental health, which make uh, the role uh, a little bit more challenging. Um, in, in terms of when we look at some of the recommendations for change, police officers are, are really, uh, again, acknowledging the, the importance of collaboration, that having protocols with other agencies uh, that are specific to, to sharing information uh, and having addendums for that privacy pieces and uh, really having those relationships with specialized services for children uh, and specialized services for adults is really paramount in helping understand and, and appropriately and effectively address domestic violence within a family system. Uh, clear for many of the police officers is uh, that there is this need for DV oversight uh, with having specialized units who can really help with uh, guide uh, more effective and consistent uh, approaches towards addressing children uh, within the context of domestic violence and of course continued need for, for training and enhanced training. So really the, the key takeaway is that you know police themselves are recognizing the need uh, for further training but they're also recognizing that there is inconsistency in, in approaches within their own ranks uh, and to really work towards filling those gaps is is the need for collaboration uh, and there's an overall acknowledgement that you know police can do a better job uh, but they can't do it alone and there's a real need for for everyone to kind of come together uh, so that's kind of the overview so i'm going to throw it over to to Kay at this point to, to take over from here all right uh thanks mike um, so Mike has focused on the police response and perspectives uh, when it comes to children exposed to domestic violence. Uh, I will be focusing more on talking about service pr provision for children uh, within violence against women agencies. Okay. Um, so just to get a sense of what some of these agencies look like. Um, so violence against women programs and services include emergency shelters, uh, crisis and support services, counseling services, and province-wide crisis helplines. Uh, domestic violence shelters are a common service within the sector uh, that's provided to women and children who have experienced domestic violence, um, and they offer protection to, to women and children who are fleeing from, from the violence. Uh, emergency shelters provide crisis um, short-term services with longer-term options that can include uh, transitional and permanent housing. And just to give you a sense of some of the, the numbers, uh, so by 2014, there were 627 shelters in Canada. Um, and in Ontario, Canada's largest province with well over uh, 14 million uh, people, there are 100 organizations that provide some form of domestic violence services. Um, so when we look at the populations of shelters, a significant amount of, of them are comprised of children and youth. Uh, just to give you a sense of some of these numbers, uh, according to a one day snapshot survey of shelters in Canada that was conducted on April 18th, 2018, uh, there were 3,137 children who accompanied 3,565 women uh, to shelters across the country. Uh, so given that such a considerable number of shelter residents are children, uh, one of the key questions that my uh, dissertation sought to address um, is what are the barriers to providing uh, child specific services within violence against women agencies. Uh, so the way that my research was conducted, um, I analyzed interviews conducted with violence against women service providers. Um, who either worked with children directly or worked in an agency that had uh, these services available for children. So altogether, my research utilized interviews with 27 service providers, 81% uh, of which were, were uh, domestic violence shelter workers, 
um, and the remainder provided non-residential services such as um, outreach counseling. And really this was an examination of what are some of those barriers to service provision um, specific to children, uh, particularly regarding risk assessment, risk management and safety planning. Uh, so based on my analysis of these interviews, um, which were transcribed and then coded, um, some of the frequently occurring themes that emerged uh, were with respect to agency related barriers, client related barriers and systemic barriers. So just taking a look at some of the agency related barriers, some of those that emerged uh, were with respect to lack of resources, uh, such as lack of funding within any agencies, um, the short term nature of some of the services, as well as lack of uh, child specific workers um, at, at these agencies. Another barrier that emerged was a lack of training, particularly with respect to safety planning practices. Um, and there was overall a lack of risk assessment and risk management practices uh, within these agencies that were um, specific to children. In terms of some of the client related barriers, um, some of these were uh, financial constraints. Um, so clients being unable to afford counseling services uh, that were available, um, a lack of awareness of the impact of domestic violence on children as well as a general mistrust of service providers uh, by both victims and children or an ambivalence towards uh, having children participating in these services. And then taking a look at some of the systemic barriers, um, some of these that emerged were with respect to a lack of interagency collaboration. Um, so for example, lack of information sharing across agencies, uh, competing agency mandates and different philosophies, and uh, one key example of this is the traditionally uh, discordant relationship between uh, violence against women and child protection agencies. As well, um, generally there was consensus that there's a lack of services for children uh, within the community, um, such so as counseling specific to exposure to domestic violence and, and follow up services. So altogether, uh, my research has found that overall, um, violence against women workers are certainly dedicated to helping their clients. Um, however, they are limited by barriers, uh, both within and outside of their agency. So thanks. I'm going to be talking about um, my results with uh, interviews with, with child protection services workers. Um, and in terms of, um, kind of a, an overview. We know that Child Protection Services has a, has a role um, for families living with uh, domestic violence and it, and it can, in terms of their mandate, um, they're central to assessing risk. And, you know, for uh, children living with domestic violence that might be considered a form of emotional maltreatment and trigger a mandatory report to child protection. And child protection has a unique um, authority within families and the execution of this role might vary widely across um, jurisdictions. In terms of, um, there has been some criticism in terms of the child protection response that in that it's been varied and inconsistent. Um, and we know that it's a complex area Domestic violence is one of many factors to consider uh, for child risk um, for, ch for workers. Um, and it's particularly challenging when there's no direct evidence of uh, physical harm to children. Child protection workers are uniquely positioned to intervene with fathers, um, but mothers are, are more often held responsible for the supervision and safety of, of their children. So I wanted to better understand um, um, what child protection workers were reporting as barriers um, in, in engaging in um, assessing risk. So I looked at um, interviews with, with uh, 29 workers from, from 19 different ages, agencies across Canada. And um, from, from the interviews, um, various themes were, were developed at the individual, the organizational and the systemic level. Um, in terms of at the individual level, uh, workers identified um, barriers um, that existed between relationships um, between themselves and, and clients um, in terms of uh, being able to work effectively with them. Um, they also noted, noted um, barriers at within their own um, profession that, that was 
challenging for them to to do their work and and ultimately at the end of the day workers can have their own style but they have to do proper risk assessment at the organizational level um, there were differences in the way um, organizations were set up to you know that translated some of the legislation and, and standards into their practice on on the front line um, and in terms of systemic level challenges um, it, mostly you know there were reports of, of lack of, of resources, um, difficulties in, in the way the child protection system was set up in terms of the conceptualization of who poses the, the child protection risk and, and thus who would be the focus of child protection interventions and, and risk management plans. Um, in terms, you know, inter interviewees identified lots of promising practices um, in terms of, you know, collaboration, protocols, enhanced training, um, and, and shifts in, in paradigm. Um, and ultimately, you know, um, child protection has a, a unique context and they have to balance the needs of parents and while also ensuring they're following their mandate to protect children it's complicated not one size um, fits all but we need these things to to be in, in place in order to ensure family and, and victim and children's safety and and ultimately I think together um, our research has demonstrated that no one sector you know can can do it alone um, and we need communities and service providers have to come together at the front and higher front line and, and higher levels to determine what works for them to keep families safe and continued efforts to improve system responses to domestic violence hold the hope that there will be a significant reduction in domestic homicides.